Hello there. You're listening to Learn Japanese Pod with me, Alex. And the podcast you are about to listen to was recorded just a few days ago with a really good friend of mine called Matthew. Now, in this podcast, we talked about our experiences of living in Japan and we also talked about our travel hacks, tips, and advice for making your trip to Japan go more smoothly. I actually first met Matthew at a Learn Japanese Pod event many moons ago, and we've been friends ever since. He's massively helped with the podcast through his support, advice, and he even managed to help me fix the website when we got hacked by cyber terrorists. True story. Now, Matthew is currently undergoing treatment for cancer. Treatment that's at the cutting edge of today's medical technology here in Japan. He just finished a course of proton beam therapy and he's also undergoing regular immunotherapy treatment. Needless to say, it's incredibly expensive, but it can help him live longer. So, if you enjoy our conversation and you want to show your support, please consider making a donation to his GoFundMe campaign to help him pay for his treatment. Please visit matthewdons.com. That's M A T T H E W D O N S dot com. M A T T H E W D O N S dot com for more detailed information on how you can donate. So, thanks for listening to this short message. And without further ado, here's the podcast. <laughs> And welcome to Learn Japanese Pod with me, Alex. And I'm joined by Matthew, a dear friend of mine who has very kindly offered to be interviewed by me、uh, on today's Fun Friday edition of Learn Japanese Pod. And if you don't know what the Fun Friday edition is, it's when we put away our textbooks temporarily and talk about all things to do with Japan, its culture, its people. And anything that happens to float into our heads. And today's topic, I thought it would be interesting to talk about traveling around Japan. And we're just going to talk about some random topics about our tips and tricks, how to travel around Japan more easily, how to make your journey a bit smoother, and just talk about some of the experiences that we've had that might help you. With your own journey. So, where should we, where should we start, Matthew? We, I think between us, we've traveled all over Japan, haven't we? So, where would you like to start? Mm. Well, I, I recently went to Kobe for the second time. And、um, Kobe is, has a very different feel from Tokyo. It's a very laid back, relaxed, slow place.、Um, Kobe is interesting because it was. Decimated by the Kobe earthquake, which is the last really, really big earthquake in Japan before. Was that Toku? 1995? It was 1995. Right. And it was, it was a particularly bad epic earthquake because it happened in the winter. Yeah. And it was in the early hours of the morning. Yeah. Yeah. So everyone was heating their houses with these paraffin heaters. Yeah. So there were lo- lo- lots of, of fires. Um, so, the, 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 the city, and particularly the, the port, Kobe is a port city,、um, was the devastated really.、Um, but it's incredible how they've rebuilt it, they've done a fantastic job. It's actually quite moving. There's a nice memorial area there.、Mm. Um, and it's just, it's, just a, a, it's just one of those cities you just think this is, this is like a perfect city. There's a beautiful harbour、uh, with. Um, a, a nice kind of quite、um, a, like a low rise city compared to Tokyo,、mm, yeah, and then backed with with lovely green hills and there's a、um, cable cars you can go to the hills, and it's just a, it has a really really nice feel to it.、Um, it's a wonderful place to visit, and it's just one of the you know m- many places outside of Tokyo that's that's really worth going to. You know, in, in Japan, it's very Easy to get stuck in Tokyo. Yeah. There is so much to do in Tokyo. It is huge. Actually, I was thinking the,、uh, the subtitle of this podcast was Today 
We're not talking about Tokyo. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about all the other interesting places. So Kobe is located in Hyogo Prefecture. It's a 30 minute, ah, 25 minute train journey from Osaka station in, in the central Osaka. And from Tokyo, I suppose you can either fly to Kobe or you can take a Shinkansen to mm. from Tokyo to Shinosaka, it's two and a half hours. And then to Kobe would be a bit, yeah, like an, yeah, like another yeah. half hour on like an express mm. train yeah. or something. Yeah. And yeah, like you said, it, it's a really nice city, the beautiful hills, lots of really good hiking in um, Hyogo as well. Lots of uh, nature. So it's it, it, it's a great place. So um, why why Kobe? Why why did you go down there? Um, so I went as part of a, a boat trip around Japan. Wow! So I started in Tokyo Bay and went first to Kobe, mm. and then to Busan, which is a a, a port in South Korea. It's wow! Quite a popular place for Japanese to visit, and then Kagoshima, which is an island. Um, is it like Seto Inland Sea kind of, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Um, which has a big volcano on. And then uh, Yokohama. Right, uh, right, where right. We, we finished up. Um, and these these boat trips are becoming um, very popular in Japan. Right. The, uh, particularly starting or, or finishing in Yokohama. Yokohama mm. Tourist Board's putting a lot of money into it. Um, and yeah. Really nice way to, to, you know, see some more of Japan. Boat trips are kind of interesting because I think there's a lot of information online about taking the Shinkansen. Uh, you can get discounted tickets from abroad if you're coming to Japan. Mm. Uh, you can use any JR train. Uh. And, you know, there's a lot of information about subways. But maybe people listening to this podcast didn't imagine that boat trips were a thing in Japan or maybe didn't consider it. So it's one possible way you can visit. Yeah, there, I mean, there are, there are still a lot of ferry lines, right? From you could go Yokohama to Hokkaido, right? Um, yeah, yeah, Tokyo Bay down to Kyushu or whatever. Um, there are ferry trips from Southwest Japan to South Korea to China. Mm. Um, you know, Japan is three thousand islands, right, right, right. Um, so it does make sense that you know there are, there are a lot of um ferry routes and now there are these kind of low end cruises which you know, I was on. Cool. Um and it's just it's just a another very interesting way to yeah, to see other bits of the country. How much are tickets generally? How does it compare to the bullet train or flying or taking a bus? So generally the ferry routes are about the same price as internal flights. Mm. Which seems a lot of money, yeah, for, right. some, for something you know, yeah. very very slow. Right. Um, you know, we should point out internal flights are expensive in Japan. Right. It's just starting, literally in the last couple of years, we've got a, a couple of um, che- uh, low cost low cost carriers, like the the, the cheaper airlines. The, the reason that flights are expensive is because if we go back to nineteen sixties when Narita mm. Airport was built. There was a lot of local opposition to building it, and the farmers didn't want to sell the land. And in Japan, the government can't buy land without people's permission. In England, the government's allowed to buy any land they like. They yeah. do what is it called a forced purchase order right. or whatever. Um, they, they, which is, they, it's happening now, right? With the right. what's the new the new train line from Manchester to London? Oh, right. There's um, a high new high speed exactly. high speed link, right? Yeah, exactly. and they're just throwing throwing the peasants off the land. Yep. it's that's an old British now, tradition. You can't do that in Japan, <laughs> right? So one of the like parts of the agreement was um, no flights after is it ten o'clock at night yeah, or something like that. Yeah. So basically, from Narita, you can't get cheap flights coming overnight yeah uh, now what's changing is that a lot of um the airlines are now moving from narita which is out in chiba to um hanada airport yeah, right. which is hanada airport is what is it technically in yokohama or is it technically in tokyo it's kind of i think it's in tokyo it is in tokyo it's near ham so basically you, you go to hamamatsucho then you take yeah. a monorail mm. to i think I think yeah, I think it's on this side of Tokyo. It's not in Chiba or yeah. Yokohama. Mm. Yeah, so it's quite close to Yokohama Bay. Yeah, 
you know, just like I mean, <clears throat> Narita Airport is nowhere near Tokyo. <laughs> My uh, quick top travel mm. tip is if you're flying into or out of or to another airport in Japan, try to mm. use Haneda rather than mm. Narita. You'll find that prices are more expensive from Haneda uh, just because it's it's way more convenient. Yeah. It, it, it's mm. uh, to Shinjuku, which is one of the main hubs in Tokyo. It's like 20 minutes. Yeah. But yeah. from Narita, it, it's a good, it's at least an hour, maybe an hour and a half, I would say, to get into Tokyo from yeah. Narita. So Narita does feel like it's out there in the sticks. Mm. So, yeah, so... So we now finally have cheap flights... Coming in. Just just coming. Um, Sorry, going back to your point about the farmers who didn't sell the land. I, I, I don't know if this is still there, but I remember like flying into Narita and you land on the runway and then the, the plane taxis in this like really weird <laughs> way because it's, it's taxiing yeah. around the edge of these farmers' fields and yeah. there's, there's this weird building in the middle of the... It looks like it's like in the middle of the runway. It's it's really weird, yeah. Uh, yeah. So so yeah. So it's sort of the the um, carriers have been deregulated. Well, they're starting to be deregulated. It's getting yeah, a little cheaper. Just starting. And so prices are coming down. Uh, ferries are kind of relatively expensive. If if you think about it in terms of just going somewhere, if you you know if you make the ferry journey part of the trip then yeah. it's very different so it's so you know in my in my case it was it was a low-end cruise so mm. you know um yeah it, it felt like very good value mm. um another interesting option for traveling in japan is is, is the night buses right and that's right. kind of a, a, a cheaper alternative to to the bullet train often around like half the price really um, but interestingly, now there are more expensive night buses, this, this luxury night buses with beds and things in. Um, so that, that's a great option. Um, it's quite surreal. You know, you take a night bus from Tokyo to Kyoto, you're going to arrive in Kyoto at like five in the morning or something um, and find a lot of stuff doesn't open until 10 o'clock in the morning. Right, right, right. You know, it, um, it, it, it's, um... it's interesting, isn't it? It's a nice... Feeling. I've done it a few times. It's an interesting travel hack, both mm. taking, say, a night ferry. I've, I've done that mm. before. From Sh I took a night ferry from Shikoku mm. down to Miyazaki. And it's the same kind of hack when you take a night bus. So the idea is that if you can sleep on the bus, some people can't. Mm. I'm, I'm quite a light sleeper. Yeah. But if you can sleep, you're saving the money that you'd spend on a hotel uh, and the actual ticket price itself yeah. is like super cheap. Yeah. And it's kind of cool, you know, arriving in a new town in the morning, kind of early mm -hmm. morning and walking around. It's nice to like wake up in a new place. Uh, definitely the ferry was much easier for me to sleep on. Yeah. I found, yeah. I found the bus is kind of mm. hard. I just stuff easily wakes mm. me up. Um, maybe a couple of suckers before you get on the bus <laughs> might help you, uh, you know, um, sleep a bit better, but yeah, definitely night buses and ferries are an interesting travel hack. You should you should look into now. When you were on the ferry, you went with your family, right? Yeah. So, and w would you say it's like a family friendly experience if you have mm, like young kids? Yeah, it was. So, so I mean, the 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 boat we were on was very much aimed at kind of people over fifty in over fifties, kind of retired people. Uh -huh. But as a family, it was fantastic because. Um, you know, we we got all the all the benefit of a low price, essentially low price cruise. Mm. Um, obviously, it, you know, it was very clear that the company was making the money in selling um, alcoholic drinks and mm -hmm. running a casino and all that kind of stuff. It's a bit like um, I've been to Las Vegas a couple of, couple of times. Yeah, and if you go to Las Vegas and don't gamble, it's fantastic because everything's subsidized by the casino industry. Yeah. So the hotels are very cheap. There's loads of free entertainment. Right. The food is fantastic. All these buffet mm -hmm. restaurants, because mm -hmm. um, they're they're making their money off gambling. So yeah, it was it was a really good option. If you go on like a like a real standard Japanese ferry, one th one kind of interesting point is that the the cabins tend to be tatami rooms right right and there's nothing right. there i mean there's like yeah. a food there's a futon and a sheet and that's yeah. it yeah um it's not like on, on a boat in europe where there'll be a 
bunk bed and a desk and a, you know it's it's literally a small bare room yeah yeah yeah, yeah. um so that's, that's kind of interesting was that like was that like a kind of like a family option like I, I've I've been on a ferry before. It was like a really, it was like a very small, like bunk bed. Mm, mm. But obviously, nothing else in the room. <clears throat> yeah, but, but I mean, it was, it was comfortable. Yeah, and, and yeah, it's just an, a nice to just travel in, you know, in Japan in a different way. So there's, right. you've got your bullet bullet trains, night bus, internal flights, ferries, um, the local, you know, just the the normal trains here are fantastic as yeah. well. Oh, well, I, I have a very short aside. Mm. Uh, I was uh, in Osaka yesterday and uh, we I was out drinking with some mm. friends and we got mm. to Shin Osaka Station at about 10.15. What time is the last mm. Shinkansen from Shin Osaka to Tokyo? That's right, people, 9.30. Yeah. I yeah. said some rude words <clears throat> um, out loud. <laughs> when I discovered we were stranded in Shinosaka until I remembered this is Japan, the land of convenience. I found a yeah. hotel within mm. literally 10 minutes. We booked a room for about $100 each. Yeah. Um, not too expensive. And then just took the next Shinkansen up the next morning. Mm. Um, See, even yeah. like at 9.30 Shinkansen from Osaka, you're going to get into Tokyo like... 11, 11 45. Yeah, exactly. And so. a lot of the tra other trains in Tokyo will have stopped. Exactly. <laughs> you, you have to be, yeah, mm. so you have to be very careful mm. when you're out at night on the town. Um, actually, in my upcoming travel course, we have a whole section on how to take a taxi, just in case you, mm. you miss the last... Yep. A train or the last bus or whatever and the oh, here's a quick japanese lesson all you do to get a taxi is you get in a taxi you say the name of the place you want and onegaishimasu so you just say ritz carlton onegaishimasu or you can say shinjiku onegaishimasu literally that's mm. it my other travel tip is um wherever you're staying get the business card of the hotel yeah. you're at and there's a couple <clears throat> of reasons the first reason is that uh, many taxi drivers tend to be older uh, and might not have um, English skills. They might not understand. So if you say Ritz Carlton, they won't understand. They might understand Ritz Carlton, mm -hmm. right? So if you if you just show them the card and say Koko onigashimasu, they'll get it, and that's it. So there you go. Take mm. take a taxi when you miss the last train, but be careful of the mm. last train. It's not like other other places, yeah. Yeah, and <clears throat> taxis here are not cheap, but they're clean. They're very very safe. I don't think I've ever heard of crimes involving taxi drivers. No, here. it's it's very um, very safe. The, the taxi drivers wear suits and white gloves. Oh, the, you you um, get yeah, into it. You get into a taxi. Mm. They're meticulously clean inside. Actually, recently they slightly lowered the basic fare of taxis. I think it used to be six hundred and ten yen. Which is what's that in dollars, mm. like seven, eight dollars or less. And then they slightly reduced the basic fare for, to like for, to for Tokyo. Just yeah, for yeah. Tokyo to like mm. something around four hundred yen. Mm. However, I did notice that after the basic fare they ramped the per kilometer rate. Yeah, they yeah, yeah, yeah. And it yeah. and the price really ramps up. Yeah. So I'm wondering if like overall they're actually charging more money. Yeah, probably, yeah. but for short you know, for a short taxi journey. It's okay, super. It's super it's convenient. Really yeah, but um, apart from everything shutting down relatively early, um, as we call like Tokyo is the city that always sleeps. <laughs> definitely after like ten thirty. Mm. Um, apart from that, the transportation system is ridiculously convenient. It's reliable. It's safe. Runs on time. Um, don't get me started on mm -hmm. how I hate the trains in the UK. <laughs> we'll save that for another podcast. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so where, where have you been in Japan that you really like outside of Tokyo? I mean, you, you've lived in Osaka and also you lived in Kyushu, Kyushu right? right. Yeah, so um, I've lived all over Japan. Um, when I was on the JET program, this is like, actually, this is a long time ago, just after the uh, the Kobe earthquake mm. that you were mentioning. Um, I came to Japan on the jet program for two years, and I was in a small town called Miyazaki. Mm. Uh, sorry, I, I was in Miyazaki Ken, Miyazaki Prefecture, in a small town called Kunitomi-cho. Mm. So we should explain <clears throat> jet program, it stands for Jap 
Japanese English teaching, Japan exchange, Japan exchange teaching program,、yeah. and basically what they did was the、um, the Monbushu,、mm. the Ministry of Education, decided to create a new educational program where they invited,、mm. generally speaking, like、uh, newly、uh, new graduates、yeah. from abroad to come in and quote unquote internationalize、mm. Japan.、Mm. Um, a, a lot of people thought that the JET program was like an English teaching scheme. Um, but but the actual remit of the program was to spread internationalization to the rural parts of Japan. The reason the JET program happened was because before the JET program became an official thing, a lot of local authorities were already employing foreigners to come to their high schools,、mm-hmm. um, junior high schools, and their elementary schools to teach <clears throat> English, play with the kids. And so the Monbushu decided to make it a an official national program.、Mm, although you are still employed by the local authority,、right? you're you're employed by the local、mm. authority,、yeah. although they re- they receive funds and support from central government. But yeah, it's it's、uh, it's local authorities. Which is kind of interesting because you can get roped into doing very odd, very things, odd things. Like, yeah,、uh, opening a local swimming pool. Or, yeah, it's、um, it it's it's a um. Generally, I had a really positive experience、mm. on it.、Um, were, you, were you based at one? Like some, sometimes you're based at one school, sometimes you're based at several. Huh? So I、were、so the jet the jet program、like? at least back then. I'm, I'm not sure、um, about now, but back then there were two positions.、Mm. There was an ALT, assistant language teacher,、yep. and a CIR, which is coordinator of international relations. The ALT,、ah. there were two types of ALTs. One would just go to a school and stay there and teach the kids. And、there was another one called was it the one shot ALT? But they would travel around all the local okay, schools、yeah. in a in a <clears throat> in a <clears throat> where the local education authority had its remit.、Um, I was a CIR, which was basically it was a very vague job description, <clears throat> but the idea was I was going to organise and promote international <clears throat> events. There was another really interesting position, but there were only a few of them. It was like a Sports exchange <clears throat> yeah, yeah. representative,、so、special skills kind of thing. Special yeah, skills, yeah. and that that sounded really、mm. cool. So people, if you had some kind of sports degree,、um, that sounded really interesting. You could go like、mm. teach football to kids and stuff like that.、Um, I was so I was in、um, Miyazaki, and it's it's again it's a quite a rural area, and that was my first taste of rural Japan.、Mm. Yeah, and did you choose there because? You can give a preference, but you're not、so、anyway you, guaranteed to yeah, get. Yeah, yeah. So you, you get、do. you get three choices.、Mm, I、mm. think I because I didn't do much. I just wanted to go back to Japan because previously I'd studied as an exchange student、yeah. for one year in Tokyo, and I wanted to get back to Japan to keep you know、mm. practicing my Japanese,、mm. and I I just wanted to come back, and so I think I. I did like Hokkaido, like Sapporo,、mm, Tokyo,、yeah. and Kyoto,、mm, and、mm. I got Miyazaki. So I, I was quite flexible. Funnily, actually, just before we started recording, we were—I、uh, was just talking about this before. I got the official letter from the Monbushu, and it said, "Congratulations, you have been accepted on the JET program. Yay! You will be going to Miyazaki Prefecture. Where's that <laughs> Kunitomicho? Huh? So this is like." Was this like ninety five or something? Nineteen ninety five. So、mm. I went to Stanford's Map Shop in Covent Garden in London because Google Maps didn't exist then. So I went in and I found a, a big atlas <laughs> and found、uh, one that, that some maps that just specialised on Kyushu, Miyazaki Prefecture, Kunitomicho. A、population of twenty <laughs> thousand, which was like so. I was actually pretty nervous before I went, but long story short, when I got there, the people were super nice,、yeah. super friendly, had such a positive experience. And if you were ever thinking of、uh, coming to live in Japan、um, to work here, and maybe you wanted to teach、mm. English, I think the JET program. If you can get、yeah. on the JET program, it's、mm. it's a really really good option because. Depending when, on where you are, you, you know you'll have very different experiences.、Yep. But、mm. um, they do sort out your visa, they sort out your accommodation, they sort out all the boring paperwork that is just a real pain. So they, they and they do look after you. It, it, it's a good, it's a good thing. And yeah, long, and if you're in yeah. the countryside, you're often give, given a use for local car. Yeah, especially if you've got several schools to visit. That's true. Sorting out Japanese lessons. 
you're often like a little local celebrity, which is always nice. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a double-edged sword, but yeah. yeah. But uh, in in the rural areas, yeah, you'll you'll often get use of maybe like the old ALT will sell you their car um, for almost nothing, yeah, yeah. or you can even rent a car as long as you have a driving license. Um, I just got lifts off the local ALT. We became mm. really good friends. We we were kind of tearing around the Japanese countryside in her Mitsubishi. What did she drive? No, no, it was a Toyota Corolla. It's quite funny. <laughs> um, yeah, had a great, had a fantastic time. Uh, although, if you're living in the countryside, you have to have a car. Obviously, uh, you you can't really survive without one. Or incredibly patient mm. friends who give you lifts everywhere. And you're going to have to learn Japanese. And you have to learn Japanese quickly, very quickly. And compared to being in Tokyo, where you can survive, you can survive without speaking. You can, you can get not not just like get by with English. You actually get by without speaking. Well, you, you can, speech. yeah, well, yeah, yeah, you, 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 you can get lazy in Tokyo because like, you know, even just going to a convenience mm. store, you don't need, you don't even need to converse with the, the person. Mm. Everything's obvious. It's all automatic. I was really lucky with my Japanese because my first year in Japan was at uh, International Christian University where I did a one year exchange student program mm. and I was in a dormitory with 40 Japanese guys wow. and their English was terrible. <laughs> so I was forced to speak Japanese for one year, went back to the UK then came back on the jet program. I was in a small uh, city hall in the middle of nowhere. No one spoke English. So then again, for two years, I was yeah. forced to speak Japanese. So it was really tough at to first, learn, yeah. but it was it was really really great. Yeah. Mm. Um, Did you were you asked to do anything peculiar? So so for like a British friend of mine who was a jet, she. Um, in like her first week, there was a certain point where she was asked to sing the national anthem, which of course for most British people, well, I mean technically we don't, but the UK doesn't have a national anthem, right? We have, um, we have "God Save the Queen." God, God, save, God save the Queen. The, God Save the Queen is actually a piece of music. There are no official words. Um, there are there are words, but those are you know there are several variations, but. I, you know, is, I is, is that something to do with the fact we don't have a codified constitution? It's or, yeah, yeah, I guess so. But it'd be very unusual for a British person to stand up and you know be able to sing and that kind of thing. So, I, did I, you ever find yourself kind of asked or anything? N- or, nothing, or, nothing, nothing too strange or weird. Or put or, on the spot. Although, although um, th- this is more about like the technology of the time. I was put in charge of the national CIR, CIR speech organizer. So <laughs> basically it's, it's so, so kind of, it wasn't so weird, but like you would be asked by the local fire department to go and give a speech mm, about sure. like the fire department in the UK. Yeah. And that, that was like really cool. A- apart from the fact that I don't know anything about the fire department. Do, do you know about mm. the fire department in your own country, right? Yeah. So, um, and, some... and this is the days before, you know, going on Wikipedia and... Well, this here, here's the <laughs> thing. I, so what, what the CIRs decided to do was that, and this, this, this will blow your mind. Um, we decided to pull all our resources together. And if you were a CIR who gave a speech on Canadian uh, police or French uh, cooking Mm. in Aix-en-Provence or something like that, you'd write the speech and then, are you ready? You would fax it to me, (laughs) right? I'd I'd type them up and I had had like a, 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 a physical folder of all these speeches and people would ring me up from, I don't know, you'd have a, uh, a, a Jamaican uh, ALT in Yokohama who needed to give a speech about reggae. Mm-hmm. So then I'd kind of look through all the speeches <laughs> and I would, that's right, fax it to him. So th- this was like the analog internet. I was kind of like the analog Google. It was that was the weirdest, most bizarre thing yeah. I ever did. Uh, it, it was it was bizarre in the fact that people would like automatically think that because you were from the UK, you were this expert on absolutely everything. And um, I think I had to give a speech on the healthcare system in the UK, mm-hmm. which wasn't so hard because I just spoke in very general yeah. terms. Mm-hmm. Um, in the Japanese countryside, the people living there are 
going to be very familiar with their you know their local cuisine and their local history and stuff so yeah it's kind of hard for them to understand that someone from london might not be very familiar with the history of london because you know it's a, it's a much weaker cultural identity than than to be from some village in the mountains in japan we well, have attempted good. to like spread disinformation about yeah you know, so, so so for example here um <laughs> a lot of older people will ask me about the Beatles. Right. And I make it clear I've never heard of the Beatles and, and <laughs> we'll get into this conversation and eventually I'll, oh, 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 actually, uh, I think I have heard of them, but there's something to do with Liverpool and I'm <laughs> born in London. I don't, um, you're, I, you're... I enjoy that a lot. That's one of the, the few but, things that gives me like real pure pleasure. But that's because you're a terrible human being. <laughs> that's <laughs> well, I also, I also when, when I'm in England, if I if I see any Japanese people, I always try to speak to them in Japanese. Oh yeah, that's that's And when fine. they're surprised, I then say, "Well, actually, most most English people can speak some Japanese. They're just very shy." <laughs> so it's like a classic thing. Is I'll, I'll see a Japanese person walking on the street. I'll go and ask them the time. Yeah. But I'll say it like, "Got the time, mate." Right, right, and right. And then I'll say it in Japanese. Yeah, right. um, <laughs> empty desk car, um, and I, get into conversation with them and, and then just claim, yeah, of course, of course most English people speak some Japanese. Obviously, you, they're just shy. I don't know how you can sleep at night, Matthew. You're, you're a terrible, you terrible human being. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, talking about the Beatles. Like I, the, I do know nothing about them. I don't like the Beatles. I don't. Well, well, no, I mean, I, I had this, I actually had this conversation. So, like, when you come to Japan, you'll notice that anyone over the age of what, like, <laughs> 40 or 50 they all love the Beatles yeah it, it was a mm. huge thing and what's kind of interesting is Japanese people say oh so where are you from and um I don't know we, I, I guess like English people we, we, we can have like this kind of naughty schoolboy in us so someone's like oh you're English and they're trying to flatter us so mm. oh you're all gentlemen I said actually I'm a soccer hooligan <laughs> and then and then I have to tell them I'm joking because they look so shocked and terrified but no i got into conversations with people where i'd say yeah yeah um the beatles are good but i just can't listen to the beatles anymore <laughs> and they look at me like completely shocked and like why says because if i hear another beatles song if i hear yesterday again i'll take that mp3 play and throw <laughs> it out the window because it's just been like overplayed <laughs> um so where were we so yeah the jet program q so fax machines so, fax machines so this is very relevant to travel mm. um fax is big here still um often you'll find things like um if you're traveling out sort of tokyo a small guest house or whatever might have a website but not take online bookings right um the weirdest thing that i find is local government when they own accommodation they'll have things like a website where you print print something off fill it in with a pen mm. fax it to them yeah um yeah a lot of families so my first host family in japan had a fax machine in the house it was a very normal thing to have um well it's still right it's isn't still, it like a, like a, a fax is still huge here now yeah. People make fun of this. There is actually a lot of interesting background in that um, Fax was killed in America because uh, FedEx ran a smear campaign against it. Because oh. they were so worried that if you could fax stuff, why would you use FedEx? Really? Um, yeah, interesting. So it was a, it's a big, big thing. <laughs> it's, it's just, history of fax machine is very, very, very interesting. Wow. wow. Um, but yeah, fa fax is still big here. So yeah, the, it is surprising the lack of online booking. Yeah. Um and the the online booking that online booking forms that you do have or uh credit like online credit card purchases that you do have or like signing up to a service you've got to fill in like 20 boxes. Yeah. yeah. And then you you press click to submit and then it resets everything <laughs> saying you your phone number is wrong. Yeah. Web, web like usability is, is kind of an alien alien concept here. Yeah. Um so so don't don't expect to be able to get, you know, to be able to do everything online here when mm. you're traveling, it's just not going to happen. Um, yeah. On yeah. The, on, you know, on the other hand, like you go to a train ticket office here and they're super, super helpful. 
to do yeah. anything for it. It's just not an issue. You know, I, 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 I do notice the lack of online booking, but it's just not an issue. It's yeah. not an issue. Although I, I would say if you're using something like, I don't know, kayak.com, one of those aggregate sites where mm. they find like the lowest price or, or, or Expedia or what you can use any one of those international online travel yeah, booking I, services. Was, They're fine. Hotels.com. Hotels, we'll booking.com. We'll booking. booking. Yeah. Um, recently, my family and I have discovered the jaw well, we and Japan have discovered the joys of Airbnb. Um, mm, which Airbnb, this been, is a big topic now, yeah, right? Yes, so it's been in Japan for a couple of years. Um, right. I was first turned on to it by the infamous Ben Brook. Aha, uh -huh, my brother, uh, ben, ben Brook, swears by Airbnb. He's going to be fan. He's going to be very upset by the latest news. If you did, by the way, if you didn't hear the latest news about Airbnb, what happened? So what what's ha what's been happening is that the Japanese government are trying to protect the hotel industry um, from Airbnb, and what they've been doing is basically bringing in lots of different petty regulations. The biggest of which they've been threatening for about a year, which was essentially if you had. And if you're on an Airbnb, you have to register it as a, is it Minpaku? Yeah, Minpaku. Minpaku, yeah. which is like budget accommodation. Right. So uh, is that a level below Min, what's the other, Minshuku? So Minshuku is like... Well, Minpaku, Minshuku, Ryokan Hotel or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So hotel is often like a Western style hotel. hotel yeah. Ryokan is like a Japanese inn. Yeah. And the key things of the Japanese inn are sleeping on a futon on tatami and meals in the room. I think it's like the, the really defining thing that you're going to, the food is going to come on a tray, a um, hundred yeah. tiny dishes. A hundred tiny dishes. And, and by the way, staying in a, ryok in a ryokan is a really, really great way to experience Japanese culture. I highly recommend you do it. And then Minshiku is like kind of guest house, basically. Min Minshiku is pretty much it's it's very similar to Ryokan, but it's yeah. more like a smaller guest house. Yeah. yeah. And then um Minpaku is like budget budget accommodation. Accommodation staying in an, an apartment type building. Yeah. Or, yeah. When, when you're in trouble in Japan, you might end up in a business hotel. That's not very nice, I think. I've I've seen a couple the rooms tend to be incredibly smoky, very small, uncomfortable, um, not very nice. So, so this 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 regulation has basically said that if you're doing Airbnb, you have to kind of run it as a min packer, which means you kind of have to register. But particularly, what it means is you have to use like a accommodation servicing company. Right. So basically, you have to pay money for someone to come and clean it or whatever. Yeah. And you get a registration number and what's happened this month basically last week is the government have said well this you know we're now enforcing this regulation mm. that says basically um you have to display this registration number mm. in your window or whatever and airbnb said um the only way they can kind of deal with this at the moment is they basically cancelled i think five days of bookings right so these right. are bookings from the i think it's on the 11th of june to the 16th of june or whatever um and then they're just trying to sort out the mess it's a massive um, mess and mm. incredibly they've said they'll pay for, you know they've said if it mucks up people's holidays or travel they'll pay for their flights home wow really um yeah. but there is this this week there is a shortage of hotel accommodation in tokyo yeah. as a result of this um but i, I mean i've found Airbnb is just amazing, really. In in Japan, it's the half of, or maybe about half of the ones I've stayed at are run by non-Japanese, often uh, Chinese or, or Koreans. Um, and typically, you know, with the way that Airbnb works is um, that you somehow get into the property without meeting the owner. Uh -huh. So they often have like a, a code lock on the door, um, because it's Japan and crime free, we've had ones where they just say, Oh, open the mailbox and get the key. Right, right, right. right. Really? And the mailbox mm. is unlocked. Yeah. And there were their, their car keys are in there as well. Yeah. <gasps> yeah. Um, but that's fine in Japan because it's, it's, it's a crime. But we, we found it so useful because, 
uh, traveling with a family. So in, in Japan, when you um, book a hotel, you're typically paying per person, not per room. Right, right. And hotels in Japan are not particularly cheap. They, for some reason I've never understood, they don't have seasonal pricing. Yeah. So typically it's this, you know, you go on like the quietest day of the year and they're still charging you the, mm. uh, you know, golden week rate or whatever. Right. Um, so we found Airbnb has, has been fantastic because uh, it's about half, for a family, it's about half the price of a hotel. Um, but also you have a proper kitchen and living room. Mm. We've enjoyed just staying in quite nice houses that are much nicer than our own house. Mm. Another thing um, is just staying in interesting places. So we accidentally booked an Airbnb in one of Japan's three slums. So there's like <laughs> there's a slum in Yokohama, there's a slum in Tokyo, like north of Ueno. What is that Sam Samyo or something? And then there's a slum, slum in southern Osaka. Um and the only, you know, it was just, we sort of, we sort of booked it and then a few minutes later I, I I kind of Googled the location just to tell a friend where we were staying. And of course, it comes up as as one of Japan's three slums. But being a slum, it was in Japan spotlessly clean, perfectly right, safe. Right, right, um, right, right. The 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 real the the way you knew it was a slum was in the vending machines that there were drinks for sixty yen. Really? So, so in in Tokyo, a, a can drink is typically one hundred and twenty yen. Um, a pet bottle, which means a five hundred millimeter plastic bottle of drink, is typically one hundred and forty, one hundred and fifty yen. Yeah. Um, these rings were 60 yen. It was wow, amazing. Wow, that's um, amazing. But it was, we, you know, we stayed there for, I think, a week, spotlessly clean, you know. You, so you knew it was a slum because there were uh, coin laundries, quite a few mm. of those, and also coin lockers, yeah. interestingly. So for, like, the, um, the homeless people who are basically uh, construction workers, right? Yeah. And there's a lot of you know super cheap accommodation around there i mean mm. there were oh they're kind of more kind of itinerant workers right? yeah exactly yeah, and right, there were right, places right. you could stay the night for 500 yen wow and of course it's 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 interesting because now they're getting filled up with backpackers right yeah so, so you could see that, right. you know there were the construction workers and the construction workers generally they're on a zero day contract right so they yeah. they have to get up early in the morning they go to a pickup point Someone will turn up with a with a truck and say, "I need ten workers." Or right, 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 right. Um, but you know, the the thing about traveling in Japan, is it is so safe. Yeah. So, yeah. like, you know, we're talking about the, the issue of missing last the last train. It's very, very different to missing the last train in the U.S. or in <laughs> right, Europe. Right, well, right. they don't have trains in the U.S. Missing right. missing the last Greyhound bus in the U.S. Right. Um, or missing the last train in Europe. Right. You're not gonna end up in a dodgy situation right 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 right, right, um, right. you know if you if you miss the last train here um japan has lots of 24-hour restaurants mm. you go to a 24-hour restaurant pay 300 yen for what they call drink bar which is like unlimited soft drinks yeah and you just and you spend, all all spend all night and get the train in the morning it, it's just not a problem yeah it's um, it's it is ridiculously relatively safe we'll say and just so ridiculous. Japan is still it is, is one of the safest countries on earth, mm. and it just, I mean, I, I just can't think of any time I've met someone travelling here who's had a, any kind of real problem. Yeah, I can't. Yeah. I literally can't think of an example. And I've, you know, lived in Japan for the past ten years, and I've travelled a lot with my family, and it's, it's just so safe and easy. One 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 night, I was many many moons ago. I was working for another company. Uh, we had a a drinking party, and I'd had one too many, and it was late, and I got on the wrong train. I got on the right train in the wrong direction, and in my drunken alcoholic haze, didn't realise I was going in completely the wrong direction until I noticed. And then it was too late. Yeah. So I ran on. I just got. I panicked. Mm -hmm. And instead of kind of thinking where the train was going, I panicked and got off at a random station. And this isn't all stations. I was just incredibly lucky. But I, I went out uh -huh. the station and came out of the front ticket gate, and right in front of me was a capsule hotel. <laughs> and I was like, Ah, oh, there is a god. The 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 the. Uh, 
the lonely planet travel god yep. was smiling <laughs> on me. So um, I am tired. I'm stinky, sweaty. I was, it was, I was just, I was a mess. So I went into the capsule hotel. It was 2000, something like 2,500 yen yep. for a night, like ridiculously cheap under 3000 yen, like $30. Mm. Um, I could then buy a new t-shirt, yep. new underwear. Yep. They had a small onsen, a small hot spring freshened up, got in the, got in the capsule, even had a small TV. Yeah. Fell asleep. Next day, went to work with the new shirt that I'd bought <laughs> and I was fine. So they, they, it's just so well set up. It's ridiculous. And also, if you, if you, if someone pushed you out of a plane with a parachute randomly in Japan and you landed, spin around randomly, choose a direction, walk a hundred meters and you'll hit a convenience store. Yeah. And the, yeah. again, a convenience store has got everything you need, food products, um, they've got like plasters and band-aids. They've got um, all everything you need. Yeah, and I mean, I, I, like when you're when you're young and traveling, you know, you you might get into trouble running out of money. But even in Japan, you know, people think of Japan as a very expensive place, but you can eat for three hundred yen. And yeah, this is like Yoshinoya. Yeah, yeah. Right, you you, you really. Um, there are a lot of there are a lot of options here. Travel is easy, safe, fun. You know, people it's are great. super helpful here. And I, I would have thought with the lead up to the twenty twenty Olympics, there are going to be a lot of like a lot more travel options in terms of um, service providers who are yeah. providing. I mean, I don't know what's happening with the Airbnb thing, but there are going to be a lot more kind of options for tours, a lot more options for places to stay. I would hope. Yeah, um, like you know, you know, even this year, some of those startups have appeared where you can have some kind of cultural experience with someone. You know, a bit like Airbnb, but yeah. instead of staying at the person's house, you have a meal with them or whatever. Yeah, right, right. Um, yeah, so so yeah, a lot of stuff like that. Some some options are disappearing. Like it's now getting harder to um, with the fish market, for example. Yeah, it's skidgy, right. Auction, right? Well, uh, um, n well, not quite. What, what, what happened was, th there's a couple of things that happened. That um, Skidgy is the biggest wholesale market in Japan. It's also more famously known as being the biggest fish market, but they sell yeah. everything there. It's not, it's not just fish. And the, the problem was that the market starts at something like 4 a.m. in yeah. the morning. So the trawlers come, basically the, tra the trawlers come back to port they unload the fish, uh, these big frozen magoro, these big frozen tuna at like 2.30. Um, the adjudicators mm. um, add pricing to all of the different fish, or, or they, they or not pricing, but they, they rank them in terms yeah. of quality. Yeah. And then I think the, I may be wrong, you can correct me on this, it, the, 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 auction, the auction starts at like 3.30 or 4 a.m. Mm. in the morning. And there are... Um, if you want to see it, you it, it, it's on a first come first serve basis, and it's something like they'll let in two groups of sixty oh, okay. people. Mm. So what that means is, if you want to get a place, you've got to be there at like two thirty or yeah. three a.m. Yeah. in the morning. I just go on Wikipedia that they've yeah. got the times. I'm probably getting this wrong. So basically, what the problem is is like a lot of tourists are like, well, let's why bother going to bed? Let's just stay out mm. and go drinking. So the problem was that they got a lot of drunk tourists who are coming and, you know, walking in front of uh, forklift trucks and touching the fish, touching the fish. And and Japanese people have a very, very, you know, strong sense of like hygiene, following yeah. the rules. And these are working guys, right? They just, yeah. They're yeah, just doing these jobs. It's not a tourist attraction. It's, right? it's not really a tourist <laughs> attraction. And so like, imagine if you're in your office and a bunch of like drunk salary men came in and started mm -hmm. like touching your PC screen. Yeah. Like you'd be like really pissed off about it. So they actually banned tourists, I think, on two separate okay. occasions. And um, another another problem with Skiji was that it, it's not fit for purpose anymore. Like the amount of the, the volume of food that they're processing and mm -hmm. the products. It's um, when was it built? Like in well, the, it's, it's it's been, a, in, it the was, yeah, in the thirties, like I think. Rebuilt. After the, the fire, like right? The fire, and then it was rebuilt, but then there was some right. problem with the building, <laughs> with the, the, the basements and stuff. And there are all kinds of problems. So, what oh, they, have you been? 
Yeah, yeah, I've been really? loads of times. I, yeah, I, I have no, I, I have no desire to. Go well, like, well, remember that. Just never struck me as being a, well, it's the, a fish market. There's two. There's two <laughs> things I would remember, and, and to be honest, I, I've been loads of times, but I never went to the fish auction. I wasn't mm. interested in that. But what they do have, which is really cool, and you can go any time of day, is just the outer market. So the inner mm. market is the fish market, and yeah. the outer market is where they sell everything. Yeah. It's mostly restaurants, but they're also selling. Um, wholesale utensils to mm. restaurants and stuff. Um, actually, I used to be a tour guide down there, so I, I know that area pretty well. Um, I would recommend rocking up there at like 10 a.m. in the morning. Mm. Well, maybe a bit early, maybe like 9. Just go, just have a walk around for like half an hour, 40, 50 minutes. Is it where it is in the Gims? It's, it's, it's really, it's really, even it, well, it's, it's, it's at Skiji Station. It's okay. And it's locate and it's located just, uh, is is it just south, south of Ginza? Of Ginza yeah. Actually, you can, you can walk from Ginza. Actually, yeah. like a nice mm. one day tour is to go to Skiji in the morning, and then walk up to Ginza and go shopping there. It's really nice. So it's um it's basically located near the port area mm. uh, in Tokyo. So what happened was that just because of the volume of um, business there and all the tourists and you know Lonely Planet discovered yeah. it and suddenly there's this massive influx of tourists it, again it's not fit for purpose so the plan was to relocate the market to Tsukiji mm. um, um, and then there were all kinds of problems the was it the gas companies had lied about um, all and these the, contaminants the, 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 exactly in the soil the and yeah. And it, and it was it was a huge scandal, and so they they've been saying for the last five years that they were going to lo- relocate mm. it. Anyway, um, Skidgy's fine. Go visit it. Go see the outer market. Rock up there at say like nine or ten in the morning. Mm. Um, just have a look around the have a look around the shops. Um, go sit in a restaurant you think that looks nice and try the food. Just just quickly on the subject of food though, I was just going back to your last point about kind of what's available and what's not available is um, with the lead up to the 2020 Olympics and this, this huge influx of tourists. um, I would say that at this point in time, Japan is not great for vegetarian and vegan options. Uh, You can find places and it's very, very slow. They're very, very slowly starting to, realize that there are foreign tourists with very specific dietary needs. So if you are a vegan or if you're vegetarian, you might need to do a little bit of homework before you come here. Um, yeah, and I think re- realistically, for if you're not in a, in a restaurant that's specifically vegetarian or vegan, you, you're often going to have to ask. And the, the other problem is cross cross contamination yeah. so you might get a vegan dish but if 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 it's a problem that they're using the same cutting boards for meat products then that again that's another problem so like, like a typical thing you'd have here is is there'd be something on the menu described as vegetable soup yeah and it is vegetable soup but it's got bacon in yeah right that just or the like stock the stock is yeah, yeah the stock exactly. is is made from a, a lot of japanese something. food is going to be fish stock based yeah and oh well, for example, like a tofu restaurant seems like a yeah, really good vegan. Absolutely, seems like no a really meat on the menu. Yeah, everything cooked in fish stock, and everything's cooked in fish stock. And I I made that mistake uh, with some Aussie friends of mine who came over. Um, you know who you are. Uh, so we went to a tofu mm. restaurant and said, and by the way, we're all we're all vegan here. And the guy just looked at me and said, "Well, this has all got dashi in it. This yeah. is all fish stock." So we had to relocate. But, and and also. With most Japanese restaurants, they're not going to be able to make you something without dashi because often yeah. it will be ingredients that are like stewed or marinated exactly. in the fish. So it's not like they can just make you the thing without dashi. Unlike, um, you know, I went to a Thai restaurant in uh, Omotsando yeah. with a vegan friend. And, you know, we said like, oh, is there any way you can... You can do stuff without fish stock, and there was no no problem at all. They just said, "Yeah, we won't put any nampler in." It's yeah. fine. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of a lot of hidden meat here, and it's, it's and, and and the idea of veganism it's is just, it's kind of a foreign concept. Well, it but, is, well, a, but even yeah. even vegetarianism, it's a bit like I remember I went to Italy with some vegetarians, um, 
not quite a little while ago now, but there is this idea that a vegetarian is someone who doesn't like meat but can eat. Right. Yeah. Right. 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 You know, um, if it's just a bit of chicken or a bit of bacon, that's fine, kind of thing. So. Um, I think um, I'm. I'm sure. I don't it, think it's mm. ever going to change. I, I I cannot imagine that there'll be. Enough. I mean, yeah. I mean, the Japanese the, the... do love to be very very accommodating. On the other hand, I just can't imagine. It's it's very difficult for us as Westerners to 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 just get our head around the numbers of like how few vegetarians there are here. Yeah, it's even it's it's with a very surprising influx yeah. of tourists. Um, and also, you know, a lot of the tourism here, foreign tourism, is um, Chinese and Thai. Right, and they're not countries famous for vegetarians. For, for vegetarians, yeah. So uh, I'm I'm skeptical about the, the, it. The, we'll see, but um, I mean, there are in very small pockets. Mm. For example, people with um, dietary restrictions mm -hmm. due to religion. So, for example, there are actually a couple of halal um, supermarkets mm. in Tokyo. Yeah. Um, and I, Tokyo Station now has halal or bento. Has I've a noticed. halal or bento, right? So, um, and so I would, I would have. Well, let, let's put it this way: with the run up to twenty twenty, I don't know how well different dietary needs will be mm. served, but there's definitely a business opportunity there, and yeah, potentially. And and there's a small, there's a small uh, community of. Uh, Western foreigners here who um, actually on Facebook there's I think the Tokyo Vegans group mm -hmm. in fact actually um, I want to do a podcast on uh, veganism in Tokyo and I'm going to hopefully ask um, someone there who's uh, will hopefully be patient enough to be interviewed by me so talk, so it, it's it's um, it's an idea that it, that is taking off but very very slowly and probably only in urban areas like Tokyo if you're in the countryside and you're a vegan, you're maybe vegan get an onigiri at the yeah. convenience store and that's all you that's all you can get. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a nikunashi. No nikunashi, meat. yeah. Nikunashi, no nikunashi, so no meat. Nikunashi there. Well, Matthew, thank you very much. It's Is there it's really important we've missed. <gasps> I mean, just travel in Japan. It's just yeah. such a great place to travel. It's great to um, travel, yeah. Yeah, and it is it is if you're living in Tokyo, it's easy not to travel. You have to yes. sort of remind yourself yeah. that you know you can jump on the bullet train and with two, in, within two hours be somewhere completely different. Well, you can even um, um, jump on a commuter train and you can be in the mountains within an hour or two hours. Um, the great yeah. thing that because Japan uh, is a very mountainous country, you 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 can get much easier access to mountains yeah, than say Mount, for example Mount Takao. Mount Takao is nice, one. yeah. It's like uh, an hour from Shinjuku or something, isn't it? And it's it's um, you know so access to natural beauty is surprisingly easy for uh, new visitors to Japan. Yeah. Hiking again uh, is another thing that maybe visit you know new visitors to, new visitors to Japan have never thought about. Um, just incredible hiking here. Like, yeah, really, yeah. really nice. The Japan Alps, um, you know, it rivals maybe Austria or Switzerland. I mean, it's it's very, very beautiful. Yeah, I mean, one just kind of my, minor thing I'd say is if you if you have Japanese friends here, or particularly if you come over and stay with a Japanese host family, um, don't kind of hold back in asking them about places to go because. Mm. They will have a lot of stock answers that are, might not be of any interest to you. So I remember when I first came to Japan, everyone was telling me go to Ginza, which is like for me the the least interesting place on <laughs> earth because it's it's right. basically shops selling Western fashion goods. Yeah, right, right. However, there are things like um, most large factories in Japan will have factory to free factory. Oh, tours, cool. Which are incredible. Right, right. So in Yokama, you can go to the Kirin beer factory tour. Oh, cool. Um, there are chocolate factories here, like a Meiji chocolate. You and, can and, go. And there's um, the, was it the great, it's got some ridiculous name in, in English, but it's like the Greater Tokyo oh, G Metropolitan yeah. Area Storm Drain Tour. Something, yeah, something. Yeah, G-Cans. I don't we, know what that stands, but yeah. I went on it with Ben. Mm. It's 
amazing it i mean it's, it's the biggest man-made underground space on earth right i mean it's, i wouldn't it's... be surprised it's, it's so basically um it's this underground storm drain that was designed mm. for overspill in case of uh flooding mm. uh in the kind of the to would you call it tokyo basin yeah um there, there are so, there are some areas that are at risk of flooding um and anyway so they, they built this thing you go down there with a hard hat on and it's all awe-inspiring. Mm. It, it's ridiculously huge. And actually, you know, that is a really cool off-the-beaten-path yeah. original mm. tour you could do as opposed to Tokyo Tower yeah. or yeah. Akihabara. I mean, th those are great places to visit too, don't I get don't me wrong. But... Tower is a good place to visit. <laughs> the, there, there, are, there are tourist traps and places that are over-visited. But yeah, there's the crazy storm drain. Beer factory tours, you were saying. Um, you can also like, I think, was it, aren't there like some steam engine tours and stuff? Yeah, and, and kind of cool. I mean, things like in in Shinjuku, you can go up the. Um, a lot of the tall buildings have what they call a viewing lobby. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you can go up the Tokyo Metropolitan viewing lobby. Yeah. And just see this amazing view from the thirtieth floor, or whatever. That's free. Then you can like go down one floor and eat in the government canteen. Yeah. Where yeah, where yeah. like a bowl of ramen is two hundred yen or whatever. Yeah. And you're wondering like, am I really allowed to eat? It's completely open to the public. Yeah. But you're also by the the government office workers. You're wondering, like, am I really allowed to be? It's really cool. Here? No, I've I've done that before. Um, you you go in and it's stuff like that in 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 Japan. That you know there are, yeah, like little factories kind of. Um, tatami factories, getter factories, which are the Japanese clogs that are described as. Um, yeah, all these kind of unique things that you can visit. Um, but your your Japanese friends and Japanese hosts may not or are unlikely to think of that kind of thing. Yeah. They'll think, oh, you should go up Skytree, which again has no appeal to me at all, or Tokyo, <laughs> Tokyo Tower. Um, Tokyo Tower is like bigger than the Eiffel Tower. Um, oh, it I, is. Yeah, oh, right. it's just, it's just, a, it's just not. A, not interesting. Not in, It's just a, a dull tower to. It climb. just looks like um, a big radio mast, doesn't it? Um, um, where, where are your like favorite? So I, I, I'm, I'm a. Recently, I've become obsessed by Oeno. I really, really like wandering around the the market mm, in Oeno. Mm, mm. Um, one of my all-time favorite off the beaten track places in in Tokyo is Odaiba. Right. 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 You get go there when when the kind of weather's reasonable and walk away from all the main touristy bits. And it's just a fascinating place because you know the story of Odaiba is that they were building it in in the bubble time. Right. And the bubble burst and they ran out of money. Yeah. Um, so the, these huge open spaces where they basically they were going to build something and didn't. And no, and there's, it's, there's... it's right in the middle of Tokyo Bay. It's just it's just a lovely place. It's got artificial beach, really nice park running around it. Yeah, no, fantastic um, for running. Great for cycling. Uh, they have an artificial beach there, which mm, is actually mm. for, for Tokyo. It's one of the few places where it was actually kind of nice yeah, <laughs> in yeah, terms of yeah. like kind of nap well i mean and you can take a, the boat across tokyo bay yeah. there's a big ferris wheel there um so what, what i mean is it's one of the places with a nice natural view yeah, even though yeah. i say natural view it's it's an artificially made beach but it, it's very nice yeah so there, there are just loads of places in tokyo away from away from the touristy bits that and the, the the other the other thing too is like yeah. uh one thing you should definitely plan is plan on getting lost in the tiny back streets mm -hmm. of i don't know shinagawa or ginza one of the things mm -hmm. i really enjoyed doing was getting lost on my bike in osaka so I, I used to live in osaka i was there for about three years and um the great thing about osaka is if you go drinking and you miss the last train um you can get a taxi back to central osaka and it's not that expensive mm -hmm. um the the used to be when i when i lived there there used to be a bunch of uh this like, group of djs who organized these uh club events and they were called uh bicycle club osaka sorry osaka mm -hmm. bike club meaning that you go out drinking you'd miss the last train but you could just cycle back <laughs> so one one of the things i just loved doing on weekends was uh, getting on my bike cycling into osaka and getting lost mm. um in the 
tiny back streets back there. You know, one day I found this um, um, arcade. It had arcade games, but they were all like 1980s games. So they had like the original mm -hmm. Street Fighter arcade mm. game and stuff. And it was just this random back street. Yeah. And so um, in Tokyo, generally speaking, anything under like, say, 10 to 15 kilometers if you have access to a bike it's just easy to ride there yeah and osaka is definitely a bike friendly mm -hmm. city so oh yeah think about doing bike tours that's yeah great so thing. Then now in um in yokohama there are bike uh you know um bikes where you can rent in the street right yeah yeah, yeah. Um, although I, I would say uh <clears throat> maybe avoid doing bike tours in august just because it's so hot and sweaty maybe like yeah although the, the, the ones in uh, in, in uh, your camera electric assist bikes oh great oh and, really and they've got cars as well now uh, what really it's unbelievable i, I I've, I've got to try one out so um you register with your with your smartphone no way and you the car is just there and is it is it electric? Um, yeah, they are. They, they they look a bit like those smart, the Mercedes smart car. But yeah, wow, they're electric wow, cars, wow. just two seater. Um, I just yeah, I just can't imagine what they must be like. That's so cool. Um, and yeah, the, the, and all all the big parks that in in Yokama, the yeah, there are these bikes that you can just um, pay pay with your your smartphone or whatever. I've been noticing and, uh, those. Uh those kind of quote unquote free bikes. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like red ones with these yeah, yeah. Uh, number panels on them. They look kind of cool. I've been seeing, I've actually I've been seeing like Japanese mm. people riding them, so it's not just the tourists, but yeah. Yeah, hopefully we'll get segues one day. That would be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> well I'm I'm just waiting for all these self driving electric cars to coming coming soon. I think they are coming soon. I, I actually, think yeah, it's... that's a fun thing to do in Japan. A lot of monorails are um, driverless. So it's yeah, always, always get go yeah. get on the front of the monorail like like the old Iber one. Yeah, and there's no driver. There's no it? driver. Yeah, that 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 monorail. Actually, that monorail um is really cool. The monorail that goes around yeah, old the, Iber. All, That's all a really monor, great. Yeah, all the monorails here are really good because the view is just fantastic. Yeah, right. It's really that, worth doing. Um and um. Or Diver is linked, well, various ways, but one of them is the Rainbow Bridge. Yeah. And that basically goes over Tokyo Bay. Yeah, which so, you, can, you can walk on it again now. So that the, for like a couple of years or something, they closed it to pedestrians. It's mm. not a particularly nice It's walk. not particularly nice, I've done yeah. It twice, but yeah. The, the, the view the is view's good, amazing. You've just got yeah. all these cars going. going uh, yeah, I, actually, to be honest, um, it, is it Shinagawa? You get on it. Was it good? Shimbashi. Shimbashi. Is it Shimbashi? I think it's Shimbashi, isn't yeah. it? Uh, I figure. You get on at Shimbashi and then take that to Odaiba. It's a, it's a great view. It, it yeah. kind of feels like uh, there's like a tourist train or something. Mm. It's, it's, it's it's an amazing view. And you get just an amazing view of the bay. Um, my gosh. I mean, hey, we could keep talking for hours. Yeah, we should, we should do a part. Part two at some point. Let, we'll do a part. Let's do a part two at some point. But um, let's wrap this up for now. Um, we kind of went all over the place, but see, that's the fun of a podcast. <laughs> and um, I should just also uh, mention that I'm going to be coming out with a new travel Japanese course soon. And that's going to basically teach you all the basic Japanese you need to know to enjoy your trip in Japan. And it's going to have lots of uh, Japanese lessons, tips and tricks for uh, visiting Japan. I will be sending information out about that very soon. Um, a huge thank you to you, Matthew, for um, coming on the show and You're giving us welcome. all your tips and tricks. I'm, and... I'm now in the mood to go and travel somewhere. <laughs> where, where, where are we going to go next? Where should we go? I want to go somewhere. Um, where do I want to go? Um, I'd Don't... like to travel more in Tokyo. Tohoku, yeah. North, north part of Japan. I hear really good things about Tohoku, northern Japan. Um, I want to go down to Okinawa again, I think. Yeah, I've been talking about six times. It's, it's a fantastic place. place anyway, people, um, as always, if you want to um, send me an email, email me at info at learnjapanesepod.com. You can find us on Twitter at twitter.com slash Japanese podcast. Do a search on Facebook for Learn Japanese Pod. You will find our page and our group. Check out the main website at learnjapanesepod.com. And don't forget, 
we have our Turbo Hiragana course and our five day Japanese self introduction challenge, which you can find at our dojo, which is where I have all my free, fun online Japanese courses with loads of free show notes and audio. And you can find that at dojo. Dot learnjapanesepod.com. That's D O J O. Dot learnjapanesepod.com. And thank you very much for listening and see you next time.